Welcome back to Long Crime Live. I'm Stacey Delacat. There is a big trial happening right now in New York City, and that is the trial against Yasalyn Ortega. She is a nanny who was charged with murdering two young children in her care back in October 2012. It has taken about five years for this uh, case to get make its way to trial, which began yesterday. Now, Yasalyn Ortega charged with murdering uh, Six-year-old Lucia and two-year-old Leo Krim, their mother, Marina Krim, was out with her third child when she returned home to her Upper West Side Manhattan apartment on that fateful night back in October 2012. Uh, saw some light coming out of the bathroom, went into the bathroom to find her two young children stabbed to death, their throats slashed in the bathtub, and she found the nanny, Yoslyn Ortega, holding a knife to her own throat. As you might imagine, she screamed, she freaked out. It is every parent's worst nightmare. And now Yoslyn Ortega uh, is facing two charges of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. Her defense team is using an insanity defense. I'm joined now by Mark Iglar, a criminal defense attorney, joining me now via Skype from South Florida. Mark, thanks for being with us. Uh, I want to start by asking you, what do you think about the defense's strategy, the insanity defense in this case? Well, it's the only one they've got. You know, it's, uh, it's not a whodunit. She came home and saw this nanny brutalizing her children, which just is so disturbing as a, as a father of three young kids. Um, there's no other defense. So that was always the defense right away. Same with Nicholas Cruz, the high school shooter recently. It's obvious there's only one defense when it's not a whodunit, when everybody knows you did it. It's why you did it. And these defenses rarely work, but it's all you got. You know, this is such an emotional case, and I can tell you, living and working here in New York City, when this news broke in October 2012, it was front page news on the local papers for days and days, and there were so many people who felt they could relate to this, because uh, there's so many working parents here who, who have nannies, you know, and, and all over the country, of course, all over the world, and these are people that you trust so much with your children. So to see something this extreme was so, so shocking to so many people, um, the parents in this, the Grimms, Mark and Marina, as you might imagine, absolutely traumatized, went through some very difficult times, but ultimately started a fund, a foundation in their child's memory. They have a Facebook page, and they put up a little video before the trial started earlier this week. So let's listen to a part of that, and then we'll come back and talk about Marina Krim's testimony. Hi, she was on the stand yesterday. We're here to give you an update and to ask for your help. After five long years, the criminal trial in our case is getting started. And over the next few months, the story of Lulu and Leo and our whole family will be painfully in the news again. This trial will be very hard for us and for a lot of you. We feel like this community, all of you, have been with us all along through this whole experience. Even if you never met Lulu and Leo, you feel like you know them, you love them, and you're inspired by them like we are. So a lot of people have been asking us how they can help, how they can support us during this really horrible time. And we thought about it, and we realized that we're going to handle this the way we've handled everything. We're going to focus on the positive and the goodness that's come out of all this. When you hear about us on the news or we come up in conversation, we want you to tell people about the Lula and Leo Fund and the Choose Creativity Initiative and the 10 Principles of Creativity. This is the legacy of Lula and Leo, and this is what matters. So this is how you can help us. So Nessie, Felix, and Linus are here to tell you what the Lula Leo Fund and Choose Okay, that was Marina and Kevin Krim talking about the upcoming trial, uh, the trial that's now underway against the nanny that murdered, uh, allegedly murdered two of their uh, young children. Since then, as you saw in the video, they've had two more children in addition to the third child they had that was not at home during the time of this very violent uh, murder. Mark Igler, uh, 
Iglar, sorry, I keep mincing your last name there, still on the line with me via Skype. Um, we saw Marina and Kevin Krim in that video, a very, very different demeanor from what jurors saw from Marina Krim yesterday. She was the first witness prosecutors called to the stand, and she recounted the night she came home to found her two children bloodied and lifeless in the bathtub with the nanny standing over them holding a knife to her own throat. She said, I just wanted to wake up from this nightmare, but I knew it wasn't a nightmare. It was like a total horror movie. She said, seeing the blood all over the bathroom. She ran out of the apartment screaming and she testified it was a scream you can't even imagine is inside of you. In fact, her testimony was so chilling and so heartbreaking that a number of the jurors and several people in the audience were wiping away tears throughout her testimony. Understandably, again, as you and I have said, anyone can relate to this and just imagining the horror of this. So, um, just based on her bit of testimony yesterday alone, I would think that the defense really has an uphill battle here to convince jurors. Don't you think jurors will be very swayed by the emotion in this case? The defense had an uphill battle when they agreed to take the case before the trial ever began. These insanity defenses work in a fraction of 1% of the cases. We go back to Andrea Yates back in 2001, when for absolutely no reason, one by one, she held each of her five children under the water in the bathtub and killed all five of them. They found her, at least initially, guilty and didn't allow the insanity defense to work. She later got a new trial, and then another jury found something very different. But that initial jury somehow found that to be nothing but a crime. In this particular case, where you've got some dispute between the, um, the children's mother and the perpetrator. So there's motive there. And you've got the compelling testimony that she gave the other day where jurors are asking themselves, what can we do for you? What do you want, mom? You want her to stay in prison for the rest of her life? We'll do it. That's what they're thinking. Now, uh, Mark, she, of course, does face life in prison if convicted on the murder charges. If the jury buys her insanity defense, she will likely spend the rest of her life in a psychiatric hospital. Now, if you were Yoslin Ortega's attorney, would you have counseled her to take a plea? If one was offered in this case, I don't know, but I would imagine prosecutors may have wanted to avoid taking this to trial just for the sake of the parents. Well, it depends on what the number is, and it depends on what the client wants. Um, and it depends on what the facts are. I, what I don't know, what we all don't know is, does the woman suffer from a mental disorder? Did that affect her ability to know right from wrong? We just don't know. We do know that most jurors don't necessarily think that someone will spend the rest of their life in a psychiatric institute. There's at least one juror who will tell the others, by the way, if you're even considering allowing this woman to go to a hospital, at some point doctors can send a note back and say, we think she's cured. And so there is a chance that she'll get out. Yeah. Um, the prosecution in this case, in addition to, of course, putting forward this very emotional witness testimony from the children's mother who discovered her, her dead children, are arguing that... Um, Yoselin Ortega meticulously planned the murders. They say she really resented Marina Krim for being this mother that she could never be. They say she was under financial stress. She had recently brought a teenage son from the Dominican Republic, where she is from, to live in New York. Uh, she was having trouble supporting him as well. Um, what do you think about um, that argument, that she was envious of the Krims and, and did this, you know, out of a sense of, of revenge to get back at them because they were not maybe paying her as much as she wanted or that she felt she would never be able to you know, be the parents that they were. I think to use the word devastating is not being dramatic. I think that if the defense had a chance of this working, there would have to be no motive at all. I mean, none. Like, why would someone do that? Well, the only explanation is they're crazy. You bring in motive and jurors are like, there it is. Yeah. I know the prosecution doesn't have to prove motive, but that eliminates this cuckoo for Cocoa Puff stuff. We're going to make sure that she never gets out of prison. Uh, Mark, one more question for you. Um, reports are that this trial could last as long as three months. Is that surprising to you? It does seem like a long time compared to, you know, how quickly some other murder trials go. It does seem like a long time, but it's not uncommon for murder cases where there's a lot of issues to be discussed, a lot of evidence. 
I don't know why it's going to take that long, but hopefully no one's going to be repetitive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, uh, a very emotional, high-profile trial that's happening right now in New York City it continues today. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Mark is staying with me. We're going to talk about another high-profile trial that is going to get underway next week in his home state in Florida, in the Orlando area. That is against the widow of the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooter. Stay with us. We'll be right back with that. Welcome back to Law and Crime Live. I'm Stacey Delacat. It has been almost two years since the Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre in which Omar Mateen entered the nightclub, began shooting, killed 49 people, injured many, many more. Mateen was killed in a shootout with police, but his widow, Noor Salman, is about to go on trial. Uh, jury selection began yesterday in Orlando. Noor is charged with aiding and abetting the support of a foreign terrorist organization and obstruction of justice. Prosecutors say she knew about this attack, that she helped her husband, Omar Mateen, case locations for the attack, and they say she did nothing to stop it. Mark Iglar is still with me via Skype. Uh, he's in South Florida. Uh, Mark, before we get into the strategies of how the prosecution and defense are going to argue their cases, let's talk a little bit about jury selection in this case, which is still underway, because obviously this is a case that everyone all over America, all over the world, knows about at the time. It was the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. So how um, do a, how do we get a, a, a fair jury in this case if everyone knows about what happened? Yeah, you know, Stacey, I'm so glad you began the analysis with that because that is the most important part of this trial and mostly every trial that I'm involved with. If you don't get the right jurors, it doesn't matter what you present. They're not open to it. They're not going to listen to it. So you've got jurors who, unless they've been living under a rock, they know about the shooting. It happened in their backyard. Their lives were adversely affected because of it. They were emotionally impacted. They know people who know people. They might have lost people themselves. So the issue is not whether they know about the shooting. The issue is whether, in spite of what they know, can they set that aside and be fair? Here's the problem. This always leads to stealth jurors. Jurors who claim that they can set aside their feelings, but we know that they're not going to do that. They have an intended purpose, and that's either to acquit or to get the person who did it. I think this is the most challenging part of the trial, and I think the defense needs to get in those people's faces, ask the right question, challenge them as I do when they say they can be fair and impartial. I try to get them to say, tell me why. How is it that we can believe you that you really can be fair in this case? Yeah, I would imagine that the jury selection is going to take a few days, if not longer, um, because this case is so um, widely known. Let's talk a little bit now about the strategy. Again, as I mentioned, the charges against Noor Salman are aiding and abetting a terrorist as well as obstruction of justice. Prosecutors plan to argue that Noor Salman actually basically signed a confession. They say that she uh, signed a 12-page statement in which she basically said she knew when he left the house, her husband Omar Mateen, he was going to Orlando to attack the Pulse nightclub. Apparently in that statement, she also says she had accompanied him while casing Pulse and other potential targets. She says something uh, to the effect of when Omar Mateen was at the home on the computer and he pulled up the Pulse nightclub online, he said, I know it, that's it, that's my target. And the prosecutors say she did nothing to stop him. In fact, they're going to use text messages that show uh, the night of the shooting, she was texting him to give him suggestions for how to cover up where he was if his mother tried to contact contact him. But the defense attorneys are arguing that uh, she was coerced into signing that statement. They basically told her uh, after hours and hours of interrogation, if you sign this, we'll let you go. And they also say she feared her husband. She suffered significant mental disorder and PTSD because he was physically and mentally abusive to her. So let's talk about this um, defense argument, really, that she was forced to sign this statement, which is essentially a, a confession. Will that hold up in court? It depends upon the facts. So the prosecution needs to put their witnesses on and say, tell us exactly what happened, and they'll go through it and appear, hopefully, if you're the prosecutor, credible and believable as they say they did nothing coercive. We simply offered her a drink and said, ma'am, would you like to help us? They read rights to her. She waived those rights freely and voluntarily and then told us what happened. The defense is going to need something more. They're going to need 
if they don't have it, you know, on video or audio where they did something to her to make her confess, they're going to need some witness. That might mean putting her on the stand, which is really risky and really problematic. Didn't work out in the Birch case we saw. I think that that's one of the worst things that most defense lawyers do is say, oh, I'm going to put my client on the stand. Really? That's one thing you can't control. So you're going to turn over your client to the prosecution who can make anybody look bad? Generally, I don't like it. So they've got to have more. And I don't know what they've got, if anything, to prove that this was coercive. Yeah. And um, of course, we don't know whether or not she will take the stand. That will certainly be something to look out for. What about this argument that her husband, Omar Mateen, abused her? Apparently, uh, her attorneys say he was abusive when she was pregnant with their child. He, he physically um, and verbally threatened her. Will, will that make a difference in this? If she says, you know, I was this abused wife. I was terrified of him. I, I couldn't do anything to stop him. I couldn't even stop him from hurting me. Yes, I think that that is a step in the right direction. The first thing it does is that it creates some potential sympathy for your client. That's obviously not what you're supposed to be doing it for, but it starts with that, that she was just a, a mother and a, a devoted wife, and she had this animal, violent criminal living in her house, and she couldn't get out of it, okay? That's, that's her argument. I'm not necessarily saying that's what I believe, but that's what she would argue. And so from that comes you know, he forced me to drive him around. I didn't know what he was doing at the time. There's no way I could stop him. He was determined to commit these abhorrent offenses. And well, by the way, they made me put down this stuff in paper that, that wasn't really what I felt and believed. One last question about this case, Mark. Uh, a question I've, I've seen written about is, well, even if she was scared of him, why didn't she report the attack at least once he had left for the club, the, the club 120 miles from their home, so he's a ways away. Why not at that point at least call in a tip? Great question, and that's something that we would all have done. And, you know, that's why the defense wants to paint this as a very unusual, abusive relationship um, and that she wasn't in a right frame of mind. It's a, really a tough question to answer. But I'll throw this out there. If the only allegation, and that's not the case here, but if the only allegation were she knew that her husband was going to commit these horrible crimes and did nothing about it. She wouldn't be held criminally responsible because she's under no legal duty, criminal duty to do anything. Morally, it's disgusting to think she wouldn't do you know, something like that and call law enforcement. But if I know that a crime is being committed and I just I see it, I look at it, I don't do anything about it. I don't aid. I don't assist in any way. There's no crime there. You can come up with some crime, but that's not going to hold water. Where she screwed up was driving him around and assisting him in any right. way, knowing what he was going to do, allegedly. Right. Well, again, the trial set to get underway next week in Orlando. Mark, thanks for your analysis on that. I know you're going to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the verdict in the George Birch trial. I want to see your thoughts on that. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Law and Crime Live. I'm Stacey Delicat. Yesterday, Green Bay, Wisconsin jury found George Birch guilty in the 2016 murder of Nicole Vander Hayden. They debated, uh, uh, the jury um, met for about three hours before arriving at that verdict. I want to quickly replay the verdict, and then Mark will join me back on the line to discuss. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we've been advised that you've reached a verdict. Is that correct? Then if you would pass the verdict forms over to the bailiff. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we've been advised that you've reached a verdict. Is that correct? Then if you would pass the verdict forms over to the bailiff. State of Wisconsin versus George Stephen Birch, Brown County case 16 CF 13, 1309. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Stephen Birch, guilty of first degree intentional homicide, is charged in the information. It is signed by our four person and dated this first day of March, 2018. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is this your verdict? Yes. They are saying yes and shaking their heads. Does either party wish to have the jury polled? Yes, Judge. All right. There's a right to have the jury pulled at this time, and this is how it will work. Uh, the juror right to the uh, left of the bailiff 
If that is your verdict, just you may say, yes, this is my verdict. If not, you can answer, no, this is not my verdict, and we'll just go down the row and around. So is yes. this your verdict? Yes. 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have one last instruction to read to you. Your service in this case is completed. And on behalf of the court, our court staff, and the citizens of Brown County, we greatly appreciate your service and the personal sacrifice that you've made in fulfilling your duties as responsible citizens. You have been a very attentive and patient jury. We thank you for your service. We hope that you will look back on this experience as a very positive one. You do not have to answer any questions about this case now from anyone other than the court. There is no requirement that you maintain secrecy concerning what happened in the jury room, but you do not have to discuss this case with anyone or answer any questions about it. If you care to do so, you may. It is your decision. Once again, thank you. Have a good evening, and you are excused. Well, there you saw the very emotional reactions in the courtroom as the judge announced that the jury had found George Birch guilty of Nicole Vander Hayden's murder. Of course, George Birch took the stand himself uh, to testify in his own defense. His claim was that Nicole's live-in boyfriend, the father of her, their baby together, uh, had actually murdered Nicole, then forced Birch to help him dispose of the body. So, uh, Mark... Iaglarsh, joining me again from South Florida via Skype. Let me first ask you, were you surprised at all by the verdict? No. <laughs> when the defendant's testimony doesn't match the evidence, that equals conviction. It's a simple formula in my world. Yeah, uh, certainly that is true. The one thing in this case, though, that had me even was the motive here, because the way this case was laid out and the way the defense argued their case was that Douglas Dietrich, um, the boyfriend had gotten jealous when he discovered Nicole having sex with George Birch, so perhaps he was angry about that. The couple had also been sparring. She had been accusing him of cheating. There had been It had been a very rocky road in their relationship. So de the defense tried to say Doug Dietrich had a motive, but George Birch didn't have one. They really hit home on that, of course, in their closing arguments. Does the, the lack of a motive here, I mean, obviously it didn't bother the jurors, but did, did uh, what did you think of that? There's a reason why prosecutors in a murder case don't ever have to prove motive. And the answer is because, well, you don't always know why somebody kills someone. It's impossible to find out what's going on behind closed doors, what really is the reason. The absence of a motive in a close case can seal the deal for the prosecution and cause them to have problems. In a case like this, the jurors didn't find it was necessary. I don't think it was necessary. The evidence supported his conviction, and that's why they found him guilty. Yeah, and just recapping some of that evidence, um, GPS data had placed him in all four locations where the murder happened, where the body was found, where the clothing were found, where the clothing was found, and so forth. And also, his DNA was found on the electrical cord that had been used to strangle Nicole. It was found on one of her socks. Um, interestingly, in this case, prosecutors introduced Fitbit data. They claimed that Doug Dietrich, her boyfriend, was wearing a Fitbit, and that the data from that Fitbit showed that he um, was not at the scene of the murder, that in fact he may have been sleeping at the time of the murder. Um, and, and this is somewhat new because Fitbits have only been around a, a, a little bit uh, a, a, for, for a few years now. But a question I have for you as a criminal defense attorney is that we didn't hear the defense call any expert to try to discredit that data. Because the first thing I thought of when I heard they were going to use the data was, are those, those things accurate all the time? You know, half the time right. I have an Apple Watch, right. I can't even get it to work half the time. That's right. Um, I don't know why. Maybe they couldn't find somebody who's really credible to say that the analysis done in this case wasn't appropriate, wasn't credible, wasn't good. Listen, I, I listen. I I want to have experts um, negate the prosecution's testimony and experts in certain cases. And I yes, I could find Vinny Boombots in the alleyway, but is he going to be credible? Maybe that's one of the reasons. Maybe there was, um, I don't know, incompetence. I, there's a lot of reasons why the defense doesn't do certain things. But Stacey, we've got to address what I think is one of the most compelling things against this guy that wasn't necessarily something that the prosecution put into evidence. When he took the stand 
and said the reason why he didn't report this right. was because he right. was afraid of going back to prison. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Yeah. Jurors yeah. are hearing that this guy has a history which they never would have and legally cannot know. So now he's telling them, by the way, I've been to prison, not just jail. I've been to prison and I didn't want to go back there. So now I'm someone who's morally bankrupt and I have an, uh, an extensive criminal history. Yeah, that is a very Nothing. good point. And interesting to note, the jurors did not know this, but that 20 years ago, George Burch, Burch was acquitted in a totally different murder case. The jurors <laughs> didn't know about that, but that's something else uh, about his uh, background. Also, when he was on the stand, he did get a bit confrontational during the cross-examination. I would imagine that didn't help his case at all when he got pretty reactive and testy to prosecutors. That doesn't help. But, uh, you know, the guy doesn't really come across very likable. So the fact that he's just bantering with prosecutors is the least of his concerns. Most jurors cannot relate to someone who has been to prison. They can relate to someone who's in the wrong place at the wrong time, falsely accused. Everyone's been down that road. They've been falsely accused of something, whether it be in grade school or whether by their parents or, or something, They're falsely accused of a traffic infraction. So they can kind of relate to that feeling. But the minute you say he's been to prison, I'm not saying that leads to automatic conviction. It just doesn't help. It's yeah. a couple of strikes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Mark Iglarsh, thank you so much for your analysis of all these cases we've discussed today. And thanks for being with us here on Long Crime, as always. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And coming up afterwards, we're going to take you live to Brevard County Bond Court. Stay with us.